Wonderful. It's so nice to be all here together. Uh, welcome officially to this 40th episode of live sessions in the Advocacy Exchange. I'm David Craig, CEO of Grit Health, and we are the partners to Bristol Myers Squibb in bringing this innovation to life. Over these last 40 episodes, which doesn't quite seem possible, we have brought together more than 5,000 people from 100 countries live together for these sessions that we co-create, and now more than 60,000 people have viewed these sessions. What makes these really impactful is that all of this is focused on the lived experience of moving through and surviving sometimes devastating diagnoses. I've been a researcher for 20 years. I've been a two-time cancer survivor also for nearly 20 years and a cancer advocate for 10 now this year. And I can honestly say that I have learned more in these three years together than I have at almost any other point in this journey. All of that is only possible because all of the organizations and individuals who make this such an authentic place to come together. I'd like to thank the more than 325 patient advocacy organizations from around the world and in more than 10 disease areas for what you've contributed to this platform and the work you do to support its individuals. At the end of this session, we're going to share information with you for two resources that we'll be co-creating this year, specifically based on lived experiences. We would love for you to share your name and information so that we can co-create these resources together. At the end of the day, we are amplifying more voices to improve health outcomes. And whether that's to help us navigate as individuals, to support our peers in lived experiences, or to change healthcare systems, we are laser focused on doing that together. And today, you're gonna meet two individuals who I respect with all of my heart and all of my mind for how they have used their personal experience and their families to create support for peers, to build community, and to create change in systems. I get goosebumps just thinking about what they've accomplished. In just a moment, you will get to hear from and meet Lisa Salberg, who has been inspired and driven by her personal experience and has spent 20 years improving lives impacted by and bringing awareness to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the leading cause of death in athletes and has received media attention due to several unexpected and high profile deaths in this past year. We'll then hear from Wayne Eskridge, who was actually a guest on our first session 40 episodes ago, driven also by his personal experience. Wayne has built the Fatty Liver Foundation to create pathways to reduce stigma and increase early detection and treatment for fatty liver which is a condition believed to affect one in three of us around the world. And most importantly, we would love to hear from you during this session. Please use the chat function to share your questions, your comments, and then we'll have a short survey at the end to collect some really important information from you. And just before we get started, I wanna thank our ASL interpreters who are with us today to make this session more accessible. If you'd like to view these interpreters, please click the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and select ASL interpretation. A floating video will appear. And Lisa, before I bring you on, I was centering, uh, trying to, to put myself in the right place for this session. And I came across, across a quote that I wanna share with everyone. The quote reads, the human heart demands adventure. But will it be an adventure of chasing our traumas or will it be an adventure to live our best life and best self? And whatever you decide, so it is. Wow. Lisa, I, I can't think of a more appropriate way to introduce you to this community. Please, everyone, welcome Lisa Salber. It's really nice to be with you here today. I'm excited to share a little bit about a part of um, the world here that I, I don't talk about much. I talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy all the time. And very rarely do we have the opportunity to kind of sit back and think of how did we get here and what was this journey like and why did I even take this journey? So it, it's been it's been a little um, a little bit of a self reflection moment preparing for this today. So thank you for that. So I'm going to jump in. I guess is that the way I'm doing this, David. I'm good to go. Okay. Yeah. 
So I was diagnosed with HCM when I was young, and it's in my family forever, but I figured I would start with giving you kind of a, a pinning as to who I am and, and why me. So most people don't start off by showing their pedigree, um, but I have a genetic disorder, so pedigrees are kind of where we live. Um, I'm represented by the heart at the bottom, the black heart, but if you follow my tree up and over, you'll see my sister died at 36. That was in 1995. She wasn't the first to die in the family too young. My father had been battling with things for a long time. He passed at 73, his brother at 47, his sister at 27, auto accident, but did have the same condition. My grandfather died at the age of 43 on the eve of my father's high school graduation. And his mother died in her early 50s. And his uncle, who you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, proving that God has a sense of humor, um, was Timothy Hart, um, H-A-R-T, and he passed away in 1906 in an iron ore mine in New Jersey. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been chasing my family for generations. And I was diagnosed in 1980 with what they called IHSS, idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, which we now call hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I have had five implantable defibrillators, um, I, I had a stroke at the age of 21 due to endocarditis. I'm partially blind in one eye and don't see so well out of the other one. Um, and I have struggled with a lot of heart failure symptoms and problems. Um, they found my gene around 2002. We now know I have a myosin binding protein C mutation, as does everybody else in my family who is affected by HCM, which turns out to also include my niece, my nephew, and my daughter. So when so many people in your family are affected, you got to kind of stand up and do something. Well, I started standing up to do something shortly after my sister died, and I found out that she didn't have to die. She died of mismanagement. So in honesty, the organization was, came from two emotions that it took me a long time to unpack and do something positive with. And the words are negative, but to me, they're actually quite positive. Anger and hate. I was angry that this disease had been stealing my family members too young and leaving us with gaps in our family tree. I was angry because I couldn't do anything about it. I was angry because the medical community wasn't there for me. And I was also, I come from a human resource and health plan administration background. So if I'm angry, I need to reflect. What am I really angry at? And it turned out that I was really angry at the systems. I was really angry at the lack of advance and understanding. So I looked in the mirror and said, somebody ought to do something about that and saw nobody standing behind me. So I got up to try to do something about what I was angry about. Then comes hate. I hate hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I hate it. It would be so easy to run in the opposite direction and pretend I don't hear it and don't see the rest of the trauma that are being affected in families like mine all over the place. So I took that hate to a place that was, took a long, took time to unpack the hate. But then when you realize what you hate, you can actually do something about. When you realize what you hate can build a community. And I have built a community of over probably 20,000 families right now from 150 countries, um, predominantly 50 countries, but we have touched 150 countries. Um, and you can take hate and turn it into love, caring, and compassion. And that's what I did. I hate hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I was angry at the way things were. So I took that forward. I would like to say that... Um, Everything just moved along duckingly and, and it built overnight and we were an overnight success. No, it took uh, many, 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 many years, lots of frustration, banging on doors, trying to sit at tables with people. And we finally started to get there around 2005. So it took like 10 years of running an organization to get there. And now I have pretty well-oiled machine, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But from a personal perspective, um, my story took another kind of turn about six and a half years ago. And that turn was, I was dying. I needed a heart transplant. And I'm in the middle of running an organization and trying to inspire a community and build centers, which I'll talk about in a minute, but I was dying. So I had to kind of stop for a second so I didn't die. 
Um, I know that sounds a little dramatic, but my heart was literally turning into a rock. I had no output and I was going to die without a transplant. Thankfully, um, my family has been on both sides of transplant now. When my sister had her cardiac arrest and died at 36, she donated her kidneys and her liver. And 24 years later, I received a heart. So if you haven't signed your organ donation cards, do so now because I'm only here because somebody said yes. My donor's name was Brandy. That's about all I know about her. And her and I are really good friends and travel together quite well. So um, wouldn't be here without Brandy. That's the family. That's the why. You may have heard about HCM because you've heard sudden death in athletes is predominantly caused by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is work done by a good colleague of ours, um, Dr. Barry Marin. 36 to 46 percent of sudden death in the young occur in um, African-American males, which is a little unusual because the disease affects everybody equally. But if you look at non-athletes, next slide, please, you will see that of all of those who die young from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy under the age of 24, only 20% are athletes and 80% are non-athletes. So our endeavors are to find all those with HCM and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Anytime I watch one of your videos or speak, see you speak, I'm always so inspired by how powerful you are, but I've never known all of the reasons why. And I know that's not easy. So thank you for being that authentic with all of us. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Wayne, um, boy, it feels like we go back quite a while. Uh, I'm so honored to introduce you. I know that you've been working tirelessly through this COVID period to really understand the experiences that aren't talked about much. And when I think about a condition that affects potentially one in three adults, I don't know how we're not talking about this more. So I am honored to introduce you to this advocacy exchange group today and then forever to put this out into the world, the remarkable work you're doing. So everybody, please welcome Wayne Eskridge. Thanks, Dave. You know, uh, following uh, Lisa is, is really intimidating. Uh, that's a, a remarkable uh, story. Um, I, uh, I'm a, just a typical guy. I was an engineer for 50 years, a typical American guy. I uh, gained a pound or two a year for 50 years, and uh, I thought I was in pretty good health. <laughs> now, my uh, staff found that picture, and I swear to you that I have no memory of having to lift up my belly to tighten my belt. Uh, it, it, it shocks me. <laughs> that, but this is, you know, so typical because with uh, fatty liver disease and NASH, <clears throat> The, uh, it, it goes along with our ever-growing size as a society. And <clears throat> I was just a typical, uh, typical guy. But uh, in 2010, I had uh, gallbladder surgery. And that picture on the right is a picture of my liver that the uh, surgeon took while he was in there. <clears throat> and well, that's, that's a pretty darn ugly picture. Uh, scared the heck out of us there, but uh, they, they basically doctors told us, "Well, you're okay. You you know you can go on with your life. You don't really have uh, stage four or anything." Uh, so even though I had that obviously damaged liver, mm -hmm. because the standard of care for liver disease <clears throat> at the time was that if you weren't symptomatic, nobody paid any attention to it. Just to give you a, a sense of uh, how this works, the uh, numbers are staggering. You know, Dave mentioned it, but there's about almost 330 million of us. <clears throat> 67 million have, and, and these are conservative numbers. The uh, the FDA recently came out with numbers that are, are over 100 million, but this is, this is a little bit older slide, but 67 million of us walk around with fatty livers. <clears throat> of that, about 20 million will have progressed to the form of the disease called NASH, <clears throat> which is where the, the fat that is accumulated in the liver begins to cause uh, cell damage. And the consequence of cell damage is fibrosis or scarring. And doctors being 
who they are. They break that out into stages, uh, stage one through four. And that's a, that progresses along and eventually uh, about 5% uh, of those people will end up in stage four. And that's what we have always called cirrhosis. And one of the things, <laughs> one of the problems we have is that whenever people think about cirrhosis, they think about an old drunk guy. You know, it's not something that happens to young women in their 40s. You know, that just doesn't happen uh, in our mind. <clears throat> and uh, so we have this uh, cultural understanding of the use of words like cirrhosis, which handicap us. But to finish this part of the story, um, we'll see uh, hep uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the cancer that is caused by NASH. And that is currently the fastest growing cancer in America. And it is uh, increasing at a horrific rate. <clears throat> so, you know, there are very real consequences to this for society. And the curious thing, I mean, it, it, it is odd in a way, because I'm like all of most of the people listening to this, probably, if I said to you, well, you have Nash, or you, if you know about Nash, you're going to think about an old car or a musical group or something, but you're not going to think about liver disease. And what we do uh, just to give you a sense of the journey, th these are my slides. 2010, I, that was, that's what steatosis looks like. That's fat in the liver. Uh, in 2015, I was diagnosed with uh, cirrhosis and all those blue bands are scarring. And the thing that led me to the foundation was that I was successful at reducing the, uh, the fibrosis in my liver, which you can see in that chart on the right. And that's uncommon, so. Wayne, as, as somebody who's gone through the cancer experience myself and been the caregiver through my, for my wife through hers, the fact that we have ways to learn about things before they progress to that stage, I can't understand how this isn't just more part of the natural dialogue. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a real failing of our education system. And it comes because, you know, we... When you grow up and somebody says that they have some kind of cancer, you have known of cancer your whole life and you have somewhere in your mind where you can hook that information. Nobody talks about liver disease at all because the liver is so forgiving. It doesn't cause any problems. And you go through your whole life until, and, and your liver doesn't complain. And then one day it just falls over and just knocks the crap out of you. Uh, so you don't have connections in your brain to remember information about the liver as you grow up. Yeah, that's such powerful framing, uh, both Lisa and Wayne. So to build on your personal lived experiences, then we're going to shift focus now to the communities you've built. And then ultimately, we're going to end up at how that's changing systems. And so, Lisa, I'm so excited to, to hand it back to you to share the work you're doing in community building and supporting lived experiences. Thank you so much. When I started my work, um, there were five clinicians who had a specialized interest in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, basically, two of them had small teams, but most of them were independent. And as I started to talk more patients through this new cool thing called the internet in 1995, like it was this new concept, people would ask me questions and I would point to these five doctors, but not everybody could get on a plane or a train or drive hours and hours to go to a cardiologist. So I had to build the pyramid backwards. I had to build the top of the pyramid first. And we built our center of excellence programs, which I'll show you on map on the next slide. But that was the top. If you were going to talk about a disease like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what good is it to go out in the community and talk about it if your local cardiologist didn't think it was a thing? Um, so we had to build that understanding. 
And then we had to get a referral pattern from community cardiologists to centers where it wasn't adversarial, it was partnership. The people who were already diagnosed, we were kind of jumping those people straight up to the centers and they knew their diagnosis. So they would go to the centers and they would build them. And 27 years after founding the organization, I'm finally at a point, 27 years, quarter century later, we can now start talking to the general public about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because we have enough centers to care for the, those who really need advanced care. And we have new therapies that are available so you can actually alter the course of the disease. So we are now at this point and I've kind of built the pyramid. Now it's fortifying the pyramid. This is our HCMA Center of Excellence map. And we, we have very specific language. We're not an accrediting body, we're a patient organization. But we, the patient organization, said, here's the model of care that we want. We need a cardiologist who truly understands HCM is going to take care of that patient as the, the core person. We need electrophysiology to solve. We need interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, genetics, nurse practitioners. We need a team because we are a disease of the heart muscle as well as the conduction system. So you have arrhythmias and you can have heart failure. And some people can have both and some will have one and some will be asymptomatic but still be at risk for sudden cardiac arrest and they may need an implantable defibrillator. So we've built these programs all over the country. We have 17 under development right now, and we are doing really great work to build this center of excellence concept that most people can have a center within a three to four hour drive of their home. So this is 27 years of my life's work on one screen. Um, there are a lot of people in each one of those centers there's a team of at least 10 uh, clinicians, cardiologists, social workers, mental health professionals, maternal fetal specialists. So we built those models. The interesting thing about this, oh, patients, you have power. Um, we built the model. Then in 2020, the accrediting bodies, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, evaluated what the best treatment model was for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And they explained to the T, the HCNA Recognized Center of Excellence model. They didn't give us credit, still a little testy about that one, but it doesn't matter who is on it. The model was recognized in the guidelines. And that now gives us extra power when a physician wants to send a patient to a center and their insurance company says, well, do you really need to? Well, the guidelines say I do. So we have something to lean on for that insurance argument. So next slide, please. And say, can I just say, looking at this slide, I yes. see it one, I see it one dimensional and feel the power, but I almost feel like if we could tip it up and look under it, you can see all the stages that you've brought together all the way from guidelines being developed to how care is delivered to how people navigate. I can feel all of that in an extra dimension. It's just so powerful. There's a lot that goes on with this map. To some people, it just looks like dots on a map. I know what's behind each one of those centers. I know the conversations that we had to have with the CEO of the hospital, with the health system, with the chief of cardiology, with the team needing to, you know, find fellows for managing the program. Like there is so much behind each one of those programs. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but they all have passion and they care about the patient community. We are not um, a transactional disease. We are a, a, a deep relationship disease. We are going to be doing this our whole lives. So you don't want a center that's not going to have sustainability that will disappear tomorrow. We need families to have a home for their heart for decades and generations. So it's hard to build. So part of what we did as the patient organization was partner with a professional medical education organization to provide what we call HCM Academy, funded by industry and full props. Bristol Myers Squibb is one of the funders of this program too. Um, as well as others. It's not a single funder program, but it provides medical education. I'm on the faculty of this of this project, I'll call it, and we are doing medical outreach to clinicians so they know what they're doing. And yeah, the patients are teaching the doctors. We built the curriculum with other physicians and with a great team, but we were at the table designing it. We brought the patient stories. We brought the case stories. We made it real and practical. And anybody can take HCM Academy. You can hit that QR code and give it to your cardiologist or your local doctor so they can learn the basics of HCM. Client services. 
So this gets into the structure of how we actually do the day-to-day -day work. And you remember, I come from a human resource background. And so I'm about operationalizing. How do you get patients to get information? How do you make it organized? I encourage anybody who is in an early stage of development of nonprofits to really think about systems and reproducibility. So we have an intake call. Anybody who calls in, we don't turn anybody away for money. We pay for it. We have it subsidized. We do ask for membership, but that's okay. So we do an intake call. We collect the information from the patient, which helps them take a moment to take stock. Where am I? Where have I been? What has been done? What have I been told over the years? How much was right? How much was wrong? What do I need to re-educate on? What do I need to tell my family? So we kind of get their brains around where they are. Then we do a navigation call. And at this point, I am still doing every navigation call, which means I have spoken to over 15,000 HCM families in 25 years. And the minute I think I've heard it all, I haven't. Something else comes up. So we do a navigation call with each and every person that comes in. It's labor intensive. It's a labor of love. And I can't change the model. We have birded warrior tours. I used to, oh, I don't have my necklace on today, but it's the logos and necklace I own. Um, so this is educational content. We provide at least one educational symposium a month, sometimes two to four a month, depending upon what's going on. And we base them on our centers. So our centers can kind of shine and we can show them what their attractive differences are and what their philosophies are. Additionally, we'll break out topics like adolescents and pediatrics and HCM or surgery and HCM, genetics and HCM. We are doing a round table on sex life and HCM because nobody wants to talk about it, but it's a really important topic. So we're going to talk about how to have a normal intimate relationship when you have a cardiac disease and your partner might be a little scared of you. Um, I have a podcast I do every Friday, different topics, different patients, different physicians. Um, and we now provide travel stipends to patients and families needing to get to Center of Excellence Care. We'll give them up to $600 to get their trains, planes, automobile, hotel, and food to make it equitable so that everybody can get to a center. Everybody can have the same level of care. So that's the 30,000 foot view of, of how we operate. It's a lot more that goes on there in other programs, but those are kind of the cornerstone. So I'm going to go through these really quick. And I know some of you that are joining us today. So if you're a patient and you're thinking, well, I want to do something, don't start a nonprofit organization. Go find the one that speaks to you and help them in their work. There are a lot of nonprofits out there in disease spaces. And maybe one isn't really hip doing what you want to do, but you want to give some time. Look for the one that matches what you want to do. In this particular case, we shared this story on what was HCM Awareness Day, which is the last Wednesday in February every year. And this young lady was a very cautionary tale. And her mother came to us saying, here's what happened. And we said, can we, can we share her story? Her story is so powerful. So Jillian um, had a cousin. We're gonna go pretty quick here, David. So you can kind of click a few ahead. We're building a family tree. So her cousin had a father. Her father, the father was diagnosed with aortic stenosis after the son was told he had HCM when he was very young. Dad went on to surgery in a low volume center and died as a consequence. Aunt is having some problems as well. Sick off and on, atrial fibrillation, not quite sure what's going on. Mom gets diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and is told that her nephew and her brother's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have nothing to do with their AFib. Not true. Um, AFib is common in 25% of those with HCM. Mom has three girls. The three girls um, had one screening because of a well child exam, you can click a few ahead here. Um, and the, the meanwhile, while that's going on, the nephew gets genetically tested. We find a gene, pathogenic gene, but they didn't do anything with that data. They just held it with, this, uh, with the cousin. So a murmur is detected in Jillian's um, screening last February. And actually um, today or th this, actually two days ago, I forgot to call her. Um, while Jillian was diagnosed in 2022 as having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which led to her mother's diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they were waiting on a little bit more information um, before they could do anything. And it was a 30 day uh, from echo 
to the event. And the event was April 22nd, I believe it was, 21st last year. Jillian died when she came home from school one day. And had we talked about the 2005 diagnosis of the cousin having any implication on the rest of the family, we would have known to screen regularly, but nobody knew. And now, as soon as we find out, she literally got the call with her genetic test results in the morning, came home from school, walked upstairs and died at the age of 17. So her mother came to us and said, what can we do with this story? Next slide, please. Actually, you can go through a few of them because we're these, these are the actual people in the pedigree. Um, so we can kind of click through this one pretty quick. This was used for something else. I apologize, I should have made it shorter. So we're putting the pieces of her puzzle together to figure out what we could have done and when we could have done it. Um, and now we know what we could have done. So we have a legislative initiative called the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act, which would check for all children in their well-child examination for family history of heart disease, ask questions specific of genetic heart diseases like HCM, ARBC, dilated cardiomyopathy, channelopathies in the well-child exam each and every year and each and every encounter from one to 19. This will give an opportunity for families to talk about family heart health history and take intervention sooner before something tragic happens like this. Jillian's gone. She's been gone for a year now. She should be 19 years old or approaching 19 years old. And instead, she's gone. Next slide. And this is the young lady that we lost. This shouldn't have happened. So what is her legacy? Her legacy is to share her story with people like you and make sure that other people get their cardiac histories taken and the appropriate therapies in the appropriate time. Wayne, if I can, just one second. Uh, Lisa, that quote that I read in the beginning feels even more true now than before. I mean, how do we move through these things, you know, possibly as individuals and families and what you're doing is helping people move through to create system change. And to see the way you're doing that is just so humbling. You you hit on the thing that we're going to end the session with today, which is us together creating a resource to help people know how to use their voice to support their journey, their peers, and change systems. And the way you've done it is just so profound. So uh, we have more than 250 people live with us today. And I just think about the ripples of everything you're sharing and how many lives they're going to touch. So thank you deeply. Thank you for the opportunity to share it. Yeah. Okay, Wayne, you're doing uh, you're doing things in a different space, but I am always in awe of the approach and the impact you take in how you do them. And so honored to hand it over to you to talk through the way you bring community together and create change. Uh, well, thanks, Dave. Anne and I just am in awe of this uh, woman. I just swear that's that's a story. Wow. <laughs> anyway. I'll never forgive you for putting me in with Lisa because she makes me look terrible. So just to, to uh, just amplify the problem we have that uh, people don't know about this disease. This is merely a an example of the kind of uh, gap that we have. You know, in what uh, we have a couple of big hepatitis uh, problems in this country. 2.4 million people have hepatitis C and only 49% know about it. 850,000 have hep B and 34% know about it. But 113 million people have fatty liver disease and only 5% know about it. So that gives you a sense of uh, just how big this problem is of, of lack of education. Just to put that into perspective, <clears throat> This is a chart of hospital admissions for Nathal D. Nash, uh, and, and that's, that, if that doesn't scare you as a patient and as a medical industry, it, you, know, you just can't be scared because if that continues, you know, we're going to absolutely destroy the, the medical system in America because Nathal D uh, disease related problems are going to simply overwhelm our ability. Now, <laughs> you know what our problem is, of course, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty big sandwich for that girl, but this is our problem. We, uh, we consume too much and, and we don't exercise enough. And uh, that uh, young lady in the corner, you might think that I just like that uh, picture because she's cute. But the fact is that about 15% of people have 
uh, fatty liver disease who are not obese. And this is kind of counterintuitive. And <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a problem that is really overlooked uh, by even the medical profession. So we approached uh, this information by trying to educate people about what the situation is. And Dave, Dave stole this uh, phrase from me, but if you have two friends, one of you has a fatty liver. It's just as simple as that. <clears throat> the thing that you don't think about is that cirrhosis is the old guy thing, but <clears throat> look at this chart of death rate there in the left corner. It is the, liver disease is the number four cause of death for people in their 40, in the 45 to 54 year old range. Now that means <clears throat> that people in their 30s, women particularly come to us saying, I have just been told that I have NASH. I have teenagers, I'm gonna die what do I do? <laughs> and this is so out of the blue for people because nobody who's 30 or 40 ever thinks that they're going to face an end-stage liver disease problem at their age. And this is really an unknown thing. <clears throat> the other picture there on the right is one that really should scare the crack, uh, crap out of you. I'm sorry, this is probably a family show, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, it does. What this is, is it measures the percentage change of, this, of the death rate over time. And for most medical things, we're making some progress. The death rate is gradually declining for most things over time. But that ugly black line, that is liver disease. Liver disease is exploding <clears throat> and it is, it is killing people at a younger age than they should be dying. And you know how, how long do you want to extend that curve? My goodness, you know, that, uh, that scale shows that uh, five, it's five times the hit on on lifespan in a period of 20 years. Now, that, that's, uh, that's a sobering thing to me. So when we think about liver disease, the thing, it, the, the, the liver is the toughest part of your body. It uh, does 500 jobs and never complains. It just does it. And that's part of the reason that we have this problem is that it doesn't give us much in the way of warning that it's in trouble. Uh, but because it does all those things, it is engaged with most of, all of the other organs of the body in one way or another. So if the liver is struggling, then other organs are going to begin to struggle as well. So the, the liver diseases are comorbid with all of the other major organ systems. <laughs> and in fact, the number one thing that people with advanced liver disease actually die of is heart failure. But the problem that we face is that the chemistry of the body gets all messed up because the liver is unable to do some of the jobs that it's supposed to do and other parts of the body suffer. So we think of it, uh, we all think that the brain is this great hoorah in uh, terms of importance to the body, but you know, the brain can't do anything at all if the liver is not supplying the things that it needs for it. So, um, Although the organization that I founded is the Fatty Liver Foundation, and that's a rifle shot at NAFLD Nash. But as I learned more, and this, this is, these are things that I learned after I got into the uh, advocacy space. And, you know, we're really young. We started this in 2017. So 
Um, I, I hope that by the time this organization is as old as leases that uh, we've done some really good things, but you know, we're just babies in this game. Um, but we, we began to realize that while our focus was on the health of the organ, we were really dealing with a broader issue in terms of, of the health of the public. And so in our <clears throat> outreach, our, in our websites, for example, we provide a lot of information about the about liver disease and about NASH in particular and the course that people go through with that. And one of the things that uh, I, I want to make sure people realize is all the things that you can die from, end stage liver disease is one of the ones that you really would like to avoid because it is years in the doing. It takes years to die of liver disease and every minute of that time is agony. And people suffer tremendously for <clears throat> three to 10 years uh, with, that, with that condition before they finally give up. Um, I personally, I, I want to die running down the street to do a deal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to go through. Uh, being being uh, terribly unhappy and sad. Um, but step back one day. Sure. The, other, the other thing that we're doing, you know, because of in, because information is difficult, we're doing the, uh, the a survey, which we started last year, which is the state of care in America, in which we do a survey of people and we will repeat this annually to track what is happening to patients in the, uh, in the, in the country and hopefully provide uh, information to doctors and the rest of the world about how this is progressing. In order to deal with the, uh, with the broader picture, we set up a project called the Wellness Leagues. And the, <clears throat> the key thing that's available now, it'll be an information source for all the comorbid situations, but the function that I'd like people to know about now is a tool that we're making available, which is our search tools. And this is a zip code based uh, way of finding out what's available in your area for supporting you, regardless of what kind of situation that you're in. So we uh, picked uh, Dave's town. <laughs> so, okay. So in Davestown, there's 2,231 uh, programs that serve the vast range of needs that people have because people see a doctor for an hour maybe, but they live 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they have all these other needs. And, and how do you find them without being absolutely overwhelmed by crap or being besieged by ads like Google. So if we picked, for example, if we looked at under health, uh, you can see that it drops down with, uh, with information that's available in the Rochester area. And it, it's highlighting addiction recovery just because that's the first on the list. But if we wanted to look at medical care, for example, these are services that are available to Dave if, uh, if he's in need and maybe he's got some pain. So let's take a look at pain. So this is the, these are these services being offered in Rochester uh, for pain management. And uh, you can find out about those. And if you look at, you need more information, it's there, how to contact them, uh, requirements, various things that you might need in order to work with that uh, operation. And we are providing this as a free service. And what I, what I offer to all of the advocate groups that are out there is that we will, <clears throat> we welcome you to take this, use it. You can, call, you can either link into it on our site, uh, 
through the just in our our system or if you would like to collaborate with us and make this a part of your system uh, this is the code that goes into your website it would be, look like this with your branding at the top instead of mine and this is a function that is free to nonprofits. Uh, we're happy to provide it and we hope anybody that wants to uh, make use of the tool will contact me, uh, Wayne, at fattyliverfoundation.org. Wow, Wayne, I have to commend you on all this. For everybody with us, this information is also available. It will be on this platform as well. So if anybody wants to learn more, you can come here or go to Wayne's website. Uh, Wayne, uh, one of the members of our team whom I respect limitlessly, Kevin Beckford, um, he really comes from the health system space and his expression is always, resource rich, but coordination poor. And what you're doing is really helping coordination of bringing folks closer to these resources. And it's just amazing what you're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you for the chance. So we're going to dive in a little bit more on one of our initiatives, which is the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. And I did see one question fly through. Should I get my kids screened for HCM? Um, well, it depends on your family history. So what we've done is we've broken our organization into a committee structure, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And I've got, I've got a repository of really smart people in my community who've got some really good um, uh, resources. Oh, this is a little bit different. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna jump into this for a second. We can talk about how everything came in. Processes. So the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act is a project and the project is run by committees. So structurally, it runs a little bit different. The navigation process and the intake process, we make it easy for patients to touch. We make sure that there are actual human beings there. It's not a bot, it's not technology, it's humans because it's complicated to talk this stuff out. Um, there are some tools that we use that are automated, but you need that human touch. So we have real human people. Some of them actually have HCM and some of them do not doing the intakes. We have an appointment system through an online system that they can schedule in advance so it's nice and convenient for them. And then there's reproducibility and there's that handoff to the center and then it comes back again. So nobody's ever left on their own. We also offer online discussion groups. We offer mentoring programs. We offer all of these things to support the patient through their entire journey once they're diagnosed. International outreach, so programming. We have figured out that um, I don't speak every language, and this is a problem because people speak different languages and have different cultural abilities to, to services. So we've started a program, and this was the first one that worked. A woman named Lutis called from Sweden and said, I have HCM and I'd like to do something. I'm like, well, let's put your oxygen mask on first, help you, and then we'll help others. Then Marianne called. She was also from Sweden, and she also wanted to do something. And I'm like, great, you guys speak Swedish. Only my grandfather spoke Swedish. Swedish, my family, so I'm out of that. So they came to the HCMA and then I introduced the two of them. Okay. Then I introduced them to some industry representatives and some physicians. I gave them a Facebook page on our link to our page so they could grow their community. They got a couple hundred people together. They all came together. They got their little group and they are now their own nonprofit organization in Sweden. So I had a baby. Um, and I hope to have a couple other babies too in other countries. So I'm not going to be able to touch every patient in every country, but I can give them the systems to develop out how they can touch the patients in their own country. So a little bit like what we're doing here, sharing best practices and how it all works. This was way more in depth specific to HCM and we helped them build out. So I was truly a kitchen table startup. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I know it's a family show. I was a human resource manager. I was a health plan administrator. I took those skills and I repackaged them because of anger, because of hate, and found the place where I could make a difference. My favorite quote from my favorite poem is actually Mary Oliver. And it's a summer's day. And the line is, tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. And I, I had a bracelet with that on. It's on the wall of my house. And it's something that I say to myself every day. I got one shot. This is it. This is mine. What am I going to do with it? 
and I've spent my life committed to this patient population. I do wanna go back to my legislative initiative for just one moment. Um, so looking at what we're able to do legislatively, you have to find your space. You don't wanna waste a lot of money and time hiring people to do things. You wanna be grassroots if you can. It comes from the heart, pun intended, but that's what we're doing here. I've already passed a law in the state of New Jersey that requires well-child examinations to include the same cardiac components that we use for student athletes. We improve the student athlete screening. We've done all of these things. Not every child needs to be screened for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are other things that they need to be screened for depending upon their family heart health history. So the person who asked, should I screen my kid for HCM? You should talk to your doctor about what cardiac tests might be needed in your family. It might be an EKG, it might be an echocardiogram, might be an MRI, maybe a CT scan, depending upon what the suspicion is. Not every child probably needs one, but if there is a family heart health history or if the child is adopted or the product of egg or sperm donation, you may err on the side of caution and look at the family a little bit differently. So that's pretty much it. Don't be afraid to do things and don't be afraid to build a community. Ask people for help. I have an amazing board of directors. They're not micromanaging. They're not in everything every day. They keep an eye on what they're supposed to do. I have I did alone for many years. And then I had a couple of part-timers. I have now grown to the point where I have a professional staff that have to work really hard to go raise the money to keep doing it every day, but we have an amazing staff. We have over 440 signed up volunteers who want to help us with committees, in-kind services, with discussion groups, with Facebook moderation, with message board moderation back in the day. And we have amazing partners from industry and other nonprofits. We all learn from each other. There's so much to be done. Don't think you have to invent everything. We can steal from each other in the nonprofit world. What worked for one can be twisted and work for another. Be happy to talk about it. Go look at other people's resources, see what's worked and have questions. This was our outcome from our HCM Awareness Day, if a month actually. And if you told me I could have these kinds of numbers, I have impressions for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy awareness. So go watch the movie, A Man Called Otto, because Tom Hanks plays a character with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's so much that you can learn with just watching a silly movie and sharing a post about it. Encourage social media involvement from your community and that will help your community grow even more. And that was perfect transition, <laughs> Lisa. So bo both of what you and Wayne are creating connect so perfectly to what we want to wrap this session up with. And so what you're both doing is helping people who are in these experiences navigate and connect to resources. And that is some of the most important work in the world. As the advocacy exchange community, we want to add something that doesn't exist in the world because it is hard to understand an experience until you've lived it. And so with that perspective in mind, we are co-creating two resources this year in the advocacy exchange. If you look down at the bottom left on this slide, it says in February of this year, we identified from your input from within this community, the two resources we would be creating in this platform. The first is specifically a resource to help patients and caregivers navigate racism and discrimination in the healthcare system. The second resource is specifically a self-assessment tool to learn how our voices, patient voice landscape looks like and where we can fit in to make a difference, whether that's a difference for our journey, for our peers, or to change medicine's development and access and care. It is incredibly hard, if not impossible, to have a full view of that as an individual. And we are committed now with all of these groups here together to create these resources. So in our last session, we asked people, how do you wanna to come together to do this? And the community told us, we wanna start with a Zoom session. We then wanna to move to an online white way to share information and compile these resources. So that's what we're doing. And coming out of this session, next steps, we're gonna bring people together to listen to your experiences. We're gonna start by listening. We're gonna compile all these resources that Wayne and Lisa and all the organization have into a toolkit. Uh, we're then gonna create a dissemination plan together so that we can get the word out about these resources. And then before the end of the year, we're gonna package it and deliver it together. And so this is our way collectively of making sure the future is better and that people who come after us have a better chance than each of us did.
Wayne and Lisa, your stories are so profoundly powerful. Your work is world changing. And I truly believe the future will be better because of everything you're doing. So I hope you accept our gratitude for sharing your time here together. Um, for all of us, we recognize every 250 person here has an incredibly intense schedule and burdens on their plate. Thank you for spending this time with us. For everybody else who will learn from this, we're grateful. Uh, Lisa and Wayne, our eternal gratitude. Bristol Myers Squibb, thank you for bringing this to life together. We are deeply grateful.